Thanks. It's great to see you all. I know that it's really a challenging topic. I'm sure that for each of you, there are probably several other people that really thought they should come and just couldn't quite bring themselves to do it. Um, always in awe of the people that call me, especially when they don't know me, and leave a message on my voicemail where they're struggling to get the words out because it's such an emotional topic. Um, so it can be a big deal. I think that it's a really uh, beautiful time of life also. It's a time where we can really connect with our pets. Um, and it's very meaningful, but it does not necessarily easy. Um, so I graduated from veterinary school in 2001. I came to Central Vermont in 2002. I was at Onion River Animal Hospital as a family practice veterinarian until 2013. And then I started a house call practice. Uh, and I did that as a general medicine um, family practitioner until two years ago when I decided to focus my practice solely on uh, acupuncture, which I do mostly out of a little office in Berlin. It's not a vet clinic, it's just an acupuncture office for pets and end of life care for pets, which I mostly do, I do pretty much exclusively with house calls. Although sometimes in acupuncture appointments we're having conversations because it's, you know, it's relevant to a lot of people. Um, when I have always been drawn to end-of-life care, uh, it's, I feel like it's a little bit of an unusual thing to be interested in, and yet it's always been really meaningful to me. Uh, as a student, I was the student head of the Pet Loss Support Hotline at Tufts, and we used to sit there. We had a room and a phone, and we would sit in the room and wait for the phone to ring on our shift, which was 6 to 9 p.m., and we had you know, different students covering each weeknight. And one night someone called and she said, all right, I know you will have the answer to this question. And I'm thinking, I'm a veterinary student. I don't have the answer to any question. She said, my priest couldn't tell me and my vet couldn't tell me. And I thought, uh-oh. And she said, but you'll know, is my dog going to heaven? And I thought, hey. Uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I said to her that I believe that if there's anybody that belongs in heaven, it's dogs because, and cats, too. There's no more pure love than the love that we have with our animals and um, that they're innately good beings. And I also stole, I think, something from Will Rogers. Uh, I said, it wouldn't be heaven to me if dogs weren't there. Yeah. So she said, I knew you would know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but there's actually a lot we don't know, uh, and there's a lot we're forced to guess. It's really challenging to try to figure out what pets want, um, what we want, how that can fit together. And we're trying to guess not only what somebody else wants who can't talk to us, but actually somebody else is a different species. So what is a good quality of life, and how do we know that? And in our struggles to try to figure that out, this is George, and she has voluntarily crammed herself into this little box, which is the size of a table paper napkins. Uh, <laughs> but I like this picture for this slide because I feel like we often feel like we're crammed into this little box with all these conflicting feelings, that we often feel the whole gamut of all of this stuff, love, anger, joy, sadness, anxiety, relief, confusion, guilt, acceptance, frustration, the pain from other losses. Uh, comes back to us, and I have lost humans that I've loved and pets that I've loved, and I've never experienced a loss that didn't come without a pretty significant hunk of guilt, which is obviously hard to deal with. So um, those are all totally normal feelings going through all this. It really is where the rubber meets the road, and it forces us to confront a lot of issues that maybe we would rather not think about, which is why I bet for every one of you that's here, there's probably three more people that couldn't make it, you know, just couldn't bring themselves to do it. So um, what I do as an end-of-life care vet varies. Uh, sometimes people call me for euthanasia when they've already made a decision. Other times people call me because they're trying to figure out the quality of life that their pet has and how to assess that and how to make end-of-life decisions. Maybe they feel like they're close to a euthanasia decision or maybe they're just trying to help their pet have a better quality of life because they're struggling with all these issues. And these are just as uh, relevant for animals that maybe are not old, but that are dealing with terminal illness as they are for animals that are older. So these are the kinds of questions that I'm asking or waiting to hear the information while people are telling me. 
And by the way, this format is really kind of weird for me. Like, I don't, in my appointments, lecture to people. I'm going to try to actually breeze through these slides relatively quickly because I want to have more time for your questions. So if we go through something and you feel like I didn't spend much time with there and you want to hear more or talk more about it, that's what I'm trying to do so that you will have a chance to ask me questions afterward. So when we're assessing quality of life, I'm looking at how they're eating, drinking, peeing, pooping, how are they sleeping, are they restless, uh, can they get around OK, do they understand what's going on, um, how's, what's their attitude like, how are they, you know, are they, do they seem happy, do they seem bored, sad, um, how are they interacting with the family? Are they doing the kinds of things that they normally would do? And are they in pain? And um, ways to kind of address this in a more, um, I don't want to say, like defined, clear, uh, objective way, maybe a little bit, are um, there's questionnaires. I printed out some of them, and we can print out some more. But these are geriatric questionnaires. It comes from the Lap of Love website. Lap of Love is a, a franchising organization that franchises veterinarians to do end of life house calls. And so the geriatric questionnaire is really useful because it goes through all of these things and gives you boxes to check off. So if you're going to go for an appointment with a veterinarian, uh, it's really handy to have that beforehand so that you have some basis on to ask all your questions and you don't forget all your questions when you get in the vet clinic. Uh, there are also quality of life scales and some people like to fill these out for their pet as they're going through the end of life process, maybe daily, weekly, monthly. It just helps to be able to look back, especially in a process that can be very gradual and where the new normal becomes something different every month or two, to look back a few months ago and see, oh, you know, I used to rate his mobility at five and now I'm consistently rating it at three. That kind of helps you get a sense of where you are. It's easy to lose track. Um, there's actually an app on the Lap of Love website, which I have not tried, but I would love to hear about it if any of you guys try it. It's called the Gray Muzzle app and it's basically just a way to track quality of life measures for your animals every day or periodically mm -hmm. on the app. Uh, and that's free on their website. And then I put bright lines up there because sometimes when I'm talking to people, they have a sense that there's something that if that happens, that will be the place where their decision is made. Like if he can't get up the <laughs> stairs anymore, I know that's really going to be hard for him because he loves to be in our bedroom at night. And if he can't do that, then that's, and I can't carry him because my own back is bad. or. You know, he loves to eat, so if he stops eating and I have to coax him to eat, then I know that's where my line is. Sometimes you think these things and then you change your mind, but it's all helpful to have that thought process. Um, so pain is a really big thing, and it's often quite hard to assess because we can't talk to them. Uh, these, this list is all things that you might see with pain, but you can see these things with other things, so they're not pathognomonic. Like somebody who's panting and pacing, might be doing that because they're painful, especially dogs, but they might also be doing that because they're confused. Um, and when dogs are old and they have dementia, that it can get really hard for them to just settle down. So that's not necessarily physical pain, but it might be an indication of distress from being anxious. Um, snapping or growling when you touch them, being irritable when you touch them, flinching when you touch them. Uh, hiding, being less responsive, not sleeping well, not eating, body tension, trembling. Um, I tried to find a picture on the web of a painful animal. This guy looks, um, you know, he's, he, he looks not quite there and he looks, he doesn't look peaceful. When I say the inward turned attitude and the thousand yard stare, you could sort of imagine yourself just sitting on a chair in chronic pain, like the pain deep inside your belly that's always happening, you're not going to vocalize. People are often looking for signs like somebody crying out because, oh, I'll know he's in pain if he cries out. But we only do that when we have acute pain. If you stomp on my foot, I'm going to yell. But if my belly hurts and it has hurt for days, I'm not yelling. But I am going to sit there just kind of hunched up. I'm not really going to be looking at things. I'm not going to be as responsive. It's a lot of work for me just to exist in that moment, just to be there because I'm painful. So. You can 
see that, especially if you've had more experience. If you're not sure, I think it's good to have a veterinarian or a veterinary technician if you know one or you can corral one. It's best to be at home because obviously when you go in the clinic, things really change a lot. Um, but that can help just learning to assess that. So when we have someone with a terminal illness, regardless of how old they are, we're looking at sleep, eating, activity, pain, and then disease-specific conditions, like if somebody has kidney disease, they're going to be drinking more and peeing more. That might affect how long they can go without going outside to go pee, um, or how quickly their litter box fills up. Um, you know, with liver disease, they can have neurologic signs, they can have vomiting. So it's good to get a good sense from your veterinarian of what you could expect with that specific disease. And then when we have older animals, this is my own kitty, Ike, who lived to be almost 22. Um, yeah. We, uh, we have all those things for terminal illness, plus things that are really specific generally to being older, like hearing and vision loss and having trouble getting around, um, having trouble regulating your temperature, and also continence issues, peeing, pooping, accidents, and just cognition, dementia. The Ike actually got pretty darn demented, and it, she was very uh, helpful for me to understand how dementia works in cats because I really didn't know how subtle it could be until I went through it with her. So I'll talk more about that later. Um, and you know, mobility issues, the, the two major things that my older patients deal with are mobility problems and cognitive dis dementia type problems. So with the mobility, the primary thing that I'm always looking to first try to relieve is pain because, again, we talked about chronic pain and how dogs and cats don't cry out when they're painful. Um, they just may or may not look uncomfortable, but we often don't know if they have pain until we try to relieve pain. And then if we can see that that's actually helpful to them, then we know, okay, there was pain. I, I'm always a fan of a pain medication trial for a couple of weeks or so to see how much better somebody might feel if they have pain meds going on. Um, when we have mobility issues, often, I mean, every older animal has this. Cats are a lot less obvious about it because they tend to just hunker down. Dogs tend to keep trying to do everything that they used to do, and it becomes more and more obvious that they're not able to do that anymore. And it's usually a combination of these factors. We've got pain from arthritis or other nerve issues. And then we have stiffness. You know, if you have arthritis and you have a joint that doesn't move the full range of motion and it's your elbow and you're stuck like this, which many dogs that have elbow arthritis are kind of stuck like this, you're going to limp even if you're not painful because your joint can't go through the normal range of motion. Um, neurologic deficits, very often in the back end, especially in large old dogs, we'll see things like walking on the tops of their feet or crossing over a very narrow stance or a very wide stance, kind of a drunken sailor gait in the back end. This isn't painful, but it makes it really hard to get around, especially when you have these other things going on. And then we get muscle wasting. We actually have loss of muscle mass in legs because they're not as active as they used to be, so they're not moving to keep their muscle mass up, plus these neurologic deficits when the nerve messages aren't going back and forth from the brain to the muscles, that, that alone is a cause of muscle wasting. So then you lose muscle mass, then you get weaker, there's more stress on your joints, uh, and then you just have generalized weakness which can be a result of many of these things. Often somebody looks really weak, but then if we give them pain medication, they actually seem stronger because they're now able to do things comfortably that they couldn't do before. And cognition stuff, this affects dogs and cats. I think it's, it's a lot less obvious in cats. Um, maybe that's because dogs have facial expressions that are more similar to people facial expressions, probably because we domesticated them, what, like 50,000 years ago, whereas cats have only been domesticated maybe 3,000 years. Cats are more close to wild animals than many dogs are. And their faces, you know, they always get, people talk about how they're inscrutable. I think that's mainly because the way their faces express things, and we're not so used to reading that, doesn't quite look like ours. Um, the other part of it is that cats that are confused do tend to just kind of do less. Um, whereas dogs that are confused, it can be more obvious because they'll go to the wrong side of the door 
when they're trying to go to get out. Or they ask to go outside, and then they don't really know why they're out there. And then they come back in, and then they want to go out again. <laughs> um, or they forget that they've eaten. Or they um, wander off down to the neighbor's house when they never did that before. Or they no longer seem to enjoy the things that they used to enjoy. I was just talking to someone today whose dog is, has pretty significant dementia. And she used to spend all day outside. And now she doesn't want to be out there. She goes outside, she comes back in. Then she wants to go out and come back in. <laughs> it's very um, clear to them that she's not enjoying things the way that she had. So not knowing what's going on, um, having a day-night inversion. This is really common for people with dementia. It's also common for animals with dementia. So we'll have yowling cats all night long. Or we'll have dogs that are sleeping all day because there's nothing going on at home. And then up all night in the middle of the night asking to go out at 3 o'clock in the morning. Like, I need to go out now. OK, you must have to pee. I'll go outside. And then we're like, oh, wow, it's really nice out here. <laughs> oh, I could pee, I guess. And you're like, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I need to sleep. So it's really challenging with animals with dementia. It's, it's a lot to manage. People are hard to manage when they have dementia. Pets are hard, too. Um, yowling, agitation, eating and drinking changes. Maybe they don't remember about eating. Maybe they don't really seem to want to eat. Or maybe they feel like they always need to eat because they forgot that they just ate. I see both of those things. So <laughs> there are some very awesome, fabulous cats. <laughs> this is Teaser and Sammy. And I chose this picture for this slide because um, there they are, so comfortable and happy in their cat beds, you know. And, and they, we get to this stage, and our veterinarians are telling us about all the tests and procedures that we might choose to do. We, as veterinarians, are trained to give you all the options. I think we're really good at giving you the options of technology and intervention, because those are clear to us. And we're not so good at talking about the options of what if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. But that's equally important, because mm -hmm. like these guys illustrate to me, Everybody would probably rather just be home in their bed than going to the clinic, and some hate it more than others, you know. But this is really a personal question because I, I sound very non interventional, and as a veterinarian, I tend to be, and that's how I've ended up where I am instead of being some super high tech vet that practices all this cool medicine. I don't dislike that cool medicine, I think that it's really useful. And I want people to have it. I'm really glad that we have access to it. I just feel like it's much easier for veterinarians to kind of go with that because it makes sense the way we're trained. And we don't really have as much training in how do we approach end of life care without those things. Mm -hmm. That having been said, they're really helpful. You know, Even if we're just doing palliative care, palliative care, the definition of that is that we're trying to treat the symptoms that somebody has without actually correcting their underlying disease process. So that is palliative care can be done really usefully with tests. If we know, for example, that someone has changes in their blood work in certain values, we can actually target that palliative care to try to help them be more comfortable uh, with that. So it's a, you know, a, a discussion to have with your vet and to go in, I think, kind of having a thought process beforehand about how much intervention might be comfortable to you. Maybe you have a sense from uh, experience with other family members or previous pets that you've had where you might feel like, you know what, I really kind of am a low intervention kind of person. Or, well, I would consider surgery, but only if it's likely to extend his life by at least, whatever, six months, a year. You know, like to have those kind of thoughts when you are asking these questions at your veterinarian's office is helpful. Often, though, you're in there suddenly facing a diagnosis that you didn't know about. So don't feel like you have to get everything figured out then. You can always come back or ask more questions. Um, one intervention that I think is really beneficial to consider kind of early on in the aging process is dentistry. A lot of old animals have trouble with their teeth. And some of that may develop in old age, but some of that might have actually been going on for a while. So if you can get a dentistry done before they get old, um, you know, this may be about eight to 10 years of old age, depending on species and size of your critter, that they, they will bounce back from that better. It's hard to want to do dentistry when somebody is old, 
because we know that even if it's really beneficial from the medical point of view, it's still a lot to recover from. There's the stress of hospitalization, there's the stress of anesthesia, um, there might be extractions, that's a significant procedure. And I've seen older animals go both ways. I saw a 17-year-old chihuahua who was really uncomfortable and not doing great come in, had terrible teeth, he had all his teeth extracted, and he bounced back and did fantastic for another year and a half after that, like super great quality of life. To me, that was worth it. But I've also seen situations yeah. where someone's taken weeks to bounce back, or you know, it's a rare but actual complication of anesthesia that someone can actually go deaf. I think that happens more to older animals. Um, and sometimes people say to me, you know, he was just never the same after that dentistry, which doesn't surprise me because going through that at an old and vulnerable age is like going through a serious illness. You know, it's a lot to have to recover from. So we weigh those things carefully. And we can talk more about interventions, about specific um, cases or diseases if you want to. So you guys might know this dog. Um, that's Charlie and Cap and uh, their local Montpelier folks. Cap is no longer with us, but I chose him for this slide because Charlie did an absolutely tremendous job of feeding Cap. Uh, Cap belonged to his dad who passed away, or actually first had to go to a home and then passed away, and Charlie took on his care. And Cap was just as elderly as uh, Ron, his person. And Charlie did an incredible job of making beautiful home-cooked meals for Cap. Um, Eating can be really an issue. It can be hard to get older animals to eat. And home cooking, at least some portion of what they're eating, if not all of it, can be really helpful. If you're going to home cook all of it, it's really best to do that to a recipe made by a board certified veterinary nutritionist um, because we can have deficits. And even in a relatively short term, that can become an issue. Um, but if you're just feeding regular food and you're going to add in home cooked food on top, one easy way to do that is to make a patty of ground meat with some vegetables that you chop up maybe in the blender and just make a bunch of patties of these and bake them all in the oven at the same time. Then you can freeze them and heat them up one by one. And there, I have seen really significant differences in how animals do based on getting some more home cooked food. And you can replace about a third of their food with home cooked food if the two thirds that's left is commercially prepared food and not really have to worry about nutritional deficits. So that's a great thing to do. And there's ways to increase their appetites, medication well, ways. Can we go back for one quick second to the, yeah. what we can? Yep, and oh, by the way, if you guys want these slides, um, you can just, I'll have an email sign up and you can give me your email and then I can just email you the slides so you don't have to worry about copying down anything. What's something, what is Entice? It's a, a brand name prescription medication oh. for appetite, nice. yeah. So on there is the, the list also is pain relief because one of the things that can cause someone to not eat well is to be painful. So I'm always thinking about pain relief whenever something's going on. Could that be at the bottom of it? And then here's a lovely short-faced dog. Brachycephalic means short-headed. And um, he has the most beautiful face, <laughs> but also some significant airway compromise just due to his adorable anatomy. Mm -hmm. And so especially when they get old, um, airway narrowing can be really a significant issue. Uh, the other problem that we have, especially with older dogs, is laryngeal paralysis. This is seen in older labs. There are those dogs that make that like Darth vader -y sound, like <gasps> when they're you know, excited or exercising or in hot weather. Uh, we really have to try to avoid overloading their airways with too much heat and too much breathing because it can actually become a life-threatening crisis. And there is a surgery to correct that, but it's hard to want to go to surgery, as for reasons we've already discussed, when somebody is old. However, people that have opted to do that surgery have ended up being really happy that they did. And I know a dog who's got, right now, still going probably another year and a half longer than he would have without that surgery. Um, so avoiding hot temperatures, exercising midday, hot cars, Having air conditioning, fans, damp towels to cool these guys down can be really helpful. They now make beds that are cooling, so that can be useful too. And getting around. Um, pain meds is my number one mobility aid, and if I've tried that and it hasn't helped enough, then uh, slings can be handy, either just for very short-term use to help toss 
a sling under somebody to help get them up the stairs. Or, you know, that's the ginger lead because that's just like, like a hammock that goes under their belly that has two handles. So we can help pick up their back end without having to lean way over and hold them. And then the help them up harness has two parts. It's got a chest part and a back end part, and they both have handles on them. And you can actually wear that around inside the house so that when you need to be helped up, someone can pick you up with those handles. Um, Ramps can help. Ramps have to be wide enough, stable enough, grippy enough. Most ramps are not. Um, and then even when they are, we have to train dogs gradually to use them by putting delicious treats on them and getting them associated with the ramp and then maybe putting the treat a little higher up. It takes a while to train many dogs to ramps. So um, just make sure it's big enough. And then rugs and yoga mats, a lot of dogs have trouble with slippery floors. And so one solution to that is just to put a pathway of cheap runners all around your house or yoga mats. And the dogs will choose to stay on that pathway so that they can stay up. And it helps them to get up. And then finally, you can make their feet more grippy. Uh, there are toe grips, which go on the nails themselves. And then there are these socks from Woodrow Wear that have little rubber grips on the bottom. And that can be super helpful, too. But all of this stuff requires attention uh, to make sure that it's working. You know, we don't want to have somebody go outside in their fancy socks and then leave those socks on all day because they're wet. So any of the stuff that we use we, on the dog itself, we have to be careful that it's working for the dog. And carts. These are helpful if somebody really could go for a walk except for how their back end is not working. Um, if their front end is significantly better than their back end, then that's useful. But unfortunately, what many of my patients, by the time I see them, the, the issue is really that both ends are having trouble and that just getting up and moving around inside the house is hard, which a cart is not going to help you inside the house. But it really could help somebody have a longer, better quality of life if their front end is OK. So dementia is so challenging. And we talked about some of the ways that it's challenging, especially at night. There's not a lot that we can do to make somebody less confused. Um, we do have supplements. There's some evidence that a lower starch diet that's high in um, medium chain triglycerides, like from coconut oil, can be helpful. I think that that probably is only useful really significantly if we start early. And many of the early signs we miss. Um, so hey, if you have an older dog, start those things now. Why not? Uh, Anapril is a medication that's been used for canine cognitive dysfunction with mixed results. Um, mostly what I'm doing with my patients with dementia is trying to help them relax if they're anxious. Our cat that had dementia was not flipped out about it. She just slept all day long. She still knew how to find the cat box. She still knew how to find the feed. So that was OK. Um, but for those that are anxious and distressed or for the dogs that are pacing and up all night trying to help them calm down and help them sleep is really important for them and for you guys also. Um, one way to help them with a day-night inversion if we can increase their daytime activity, like if we could take them to work with us where it's just a more lively environment, they don't have the wherewithal or the strength to do a lot of stuff, but just being somewhere where stuff is happening as opposed to home sleeping all day could really help them be more awake during the day and more asleep at night. And just like you've probably experienced if you have humans in your life with dementia, when things change for them, like the living environment changes or people change, it can be really unsettling. So even just moving the furniture around in your house is unsettling. I say this not to say don't make any changes, but so that you know that when they have a hard time, it's not your fault. Like It's just the process of the disease of, of having dementia. It's, it's the way it is for them. So many times people talk to me about wanting a natural death. And um, often, I, pretty much every consult that I have, people will say something like, oh, I wish that he would just just not wake up in the morning, You know that, that that would be a peaceful way for him to go. And they're recognizing that already life has become something of a struggle for their animal, and that also it's a struggle for us, like that we're trying to figure out what they want and you know how they feel, and that we know that things are going to get worse for them, and we wish them just a peaceful end. Um, 
and people would like to have their pets and be as close to that as possible, and yet we're really often challenged by the fact that much of what goes on in the end of life for pets is not immediately life-threatening unless it's really uncomfortable, um, and that a lot of the time what happens with them, most of the rest of them works okay, and there's this one thing that doesn't. So if we have a really arthritic dog who can't even really get up, but his liver and his heart and his lungs and his kidneys are all fine, he's not going to go from natural causes. If we have, I just saw this dog today who's actually in pretty great shape physically, but um, cognitively she's really having challenges and she's very agitated about that. So life already has some really serious quality of life issues, but there's nothing there that's going to, you know, unless, I mean, she's an older lady, like in people years, she's about 80 to 85, so anything could happen, but it isn't necessarily likely that she'll just go. Like, that's why I'm saying not choosing is choosing, because we can't just hope that they'll go. We have to be there and recognize that what is going on with them and, and can we make that better and if we can't make that better then maybe we have to make some decisions. Hospice care is, you know, it's, it's basically, it can eventually include euthanasia but generally we think of it as, as being sort of the opposite of end of life of euthanasia. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, the goals of hospice are to help somebody have as comfortable an end to their life as possible. Um, and as natural of a death as they can, although there are the, all these pain medication interventions, um, but we don't you know, try to make them eat if they're not eating. We don't try to make them drink if they're not drinking. We try to be guided by their process and also add in pain relief. It's really hard to do that with pets because there's no support network for people to have hospice care for pets. There's no visiting nurses, there's no hospice volunteers, and so all of that care falls on the shoulders of the person or people who are home, you know, who are the owners or guardians or pet parents or however you want to say that. It's just a ton of responsibility and care to shoulder, and it can get really hard. So I think most of the time people do end up making a euthanasia decision even if they'd rather not, and that can be really hard. Uh, you know, it's comfortable for me to think about euthanasia as the end of life, but for a lot of people it feels very uncomfortable. I've had people say to me more than once, I feel like I'm murdering my dog. You know, they, they have spent their, this whole animal's life caring for them and loving them and protecting them from harm and helping them be as healthy and comfortable as possible. And then we get to this place where they now, you know, essentially they're saying to me, okay, you know, that this is it. I order the death of my dog. Like that can feel so bad. I respect and understand that. And it's really, it can be a very anguishing struggle to think about euthanasia when you feel that way about euthanasia. And it's, again, totally normal. This is just a gamut, you know. Everybody feels different ways and this is not right to feel that euthanasia is right. It's just, at this stage, the way we have veterinary care, the option that ends up making the most sense for quality of life for most animals at some point. Um, and sometimes I feel like we can overlook problems that they're having in our wish not to deal with the fact that they're at the end of their life. I, I never see anybody not thinking about this, but I do sometimes see people a little bit, I think, in denial about how much pain their animal might be in or how uncomfortable they might be because maybe they don't have a good solution. I mean, there does come a point in a lot of animals' lives where they are so uncomfortable that the only way to make them comfortable would be to sedate them to the point that they're not aware of their discomfort. Like maybe they're having a lot of trouble breathing and that's stressful or their body is in a lot of pain, um, you know, it, it's challenging. If somebody wanted to do that and have me work with them on that, I would do that. I respect and appreciate that. So I'm not ruling it out, but I think most people feel like the work of it and the cost of it is just like the financial cost is too much. So <coughs> euthanasia, um, just really simply, the options are being at home, being in a vet clinic, 
Um, you may plan ahead on this or you might find yourself taken by surprise and needing this urgently. Uh, the more urgent it is, the harder it can be to make arrangements to be at home, so that's worth thinking about. At this stage, most veterinarians do euthanasia pretty much the same way. We give sedation first. Most of us give that injectably because it's quick and it, it's very reliable and very thorough sedation. And then once we have them to the point where they're not feeling anything anymore, then we give the second injection, which is the euthanasia solution, which actually stops their heart. Um, and the way I do that is all designed to try to make it as comfortable and peaceful for everybody as possible. And I have never met a veterinarian who doesn't feel that way. Um, but all, each of us has different training and maybe different techniques. Um, so it's worth asking how will this go beforehand if you're wondering about that. And then afterwards, you have the option of burial at home or some other location if you have a friend that you can bury uh, at their house or cremation, which um, you can have the ashes returned to you or you can choose not to have them returned. And when I uh, do home euthanasia, I offer the service of taking the pet with me for cremation and then bringing the ashes back home to people. But I also am fine with people wanting to make their own arrangements. There's a pet crematory in Northfield that I work with and that most of the vets around work with that's very reliable. Or one could call up a local veterinarian's office and ask them, to take the body for cremation and they would do that and then you would come to the office and pick up the ashes afterward. And people are often wondering, what happens if I'm getting these ashes back, are these really my pet's ashes? How can I know that? Um, I think that's very reasonable to wonder about. We've all heard those awful stories when it's not the case. The crematory that I work with here, I've been working with for years and I trust them that they're doing a good job. Um, and they. I can explain more in detail, but I, I, they set things up so that what you're getting back truly is the ashes of your pet. Um, and I'll tell you more about that if you have questions. So here's Mambo. He's a lovely boy. And as far as I know, he's doing fine. So I don't mean this slide to be pretentious for his life. But he's so beautiful with his crazy little face and his 11-year-old pup cake. <laughs> Underbite, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and this is the burning question that everybody is wondering when I'm talking to them. How do they know when it's time? Most people I'm talking to are making a euthanasia decision, so that's what this question is about. Um, and there is no simple answer, and I don't pretend to have the answer. I don't think anybody knows, no veterinarian knows. But some of the things that help me when I think about this are to imagine uh, life as this kind of this shape where early on, you know, we're born and then we do all this stuff and we, all these interesting things happen and we do all these things, this is our midlife. And then we get to this end where things really narrow down and we just come to this little tip. And instead of, you know, going out and hiking or doing all the things that, that everybody does, <laughs> hunting for mice, whatever it is that they're doing that they love to do, you know, I think of my kitty Ike when she was about 20 years old. She just pretty much stopped doing anything but sleeping. And all day long she was just sleeping. And that was when I started to think, how is this for quality of life for you? Like, is this good enough? How do I know it's good enough? What, what, are you satisfied? And then I would pick her up. And she, I don't think she knew anymore who I was, who she was, what being a cat meant, you know? <laughs> but I would pick her up and she would purr. And I thought, OK. I don't know, you know, cats can purr for many reasons. They don't always purr because they're happy. But my thought was, it may be that she knows that we love her. And it may be that in her IUA that she loves us. And like, here I am just holding her, and I feel like she can feel that. And I decided that that was enough for me at that point, because she wasn't obviously suffering in some other major way. Um, but there we were at the end of this little tip. And when we are thinking about um, when to, to make a euthanasia decision, we get really focused on the right time. And we start parsing every little thing that happens. Because you know there's ups and downs. And we're thinking, like, OK, today was a better day. But then he didn't eat in the evening. And then you know, and we're really trying to figure out, when, when do I do this? And I totally get that, because it's a really weird job to have to try to make a decision that is a, a life and death decision for someone you love in the middle of a process that is not linear 
and is ongoing and is gradual. Like what makes today worse than last week in that way that now he should be dead? This is, you know, it's, it's a really hard question. Um, and yet, you know, to me, when we get to that point, we're actually in this sort of gray area, I often call it, where it's not obvious that we shouldn't do this and it's not obvious that we should. Like it's okay to make that decision at any point in this gray area um, and we haven't yet got to the point where it's an absolute no-brainer, where there's nothing left that's good in that pet's life and we know that it's absolutely no question time. Um, and people are ready at different times. This is a bell curve, which is just the normal distribution of data in any given situation. And so some people are gonna be ready earlier in this process of decline. Most people are gonna be ready somewhere in the middle of this process decline. And some people aren't ready until later on in the process of decline. And I respect all of that because I think that there, I've never seen anybody not wrestling with this question, not feeling intensely committed to the good life of their pet and wanting to do the right thing for their pet and wrestling with those questions of guilt and am I being selfish and you know how do I make this decision for him so I, I do not have an easy answer to this question but I do feel like you can't make the wrong decision you know the right time is a, there is no one right time there's just a place of time where it is an appropriate decision so I hope that takes a little pressure off because the thing is that we're just people. Like we don't know anything, you know? We are so limited in what we can actually know about what goes on. And we're just trying to do a good job to make somebody happy and as comfortable as we can. And we have to just kind of be okay with the fact that we can't know. We can't know how these meds affect them other than what we can see and observe. We can't know what they want. We can't really know how they feel. You know, I, I, I just hope it's comforting in some way, comforting to know that we're doing the best that we can and that's all we can do and that it's love. Ultimately, at the end of it, it's really just about mm -hmm. love. Um, I had someone once ask me about, you know, interventions like have me come to the house and here's what I'm doing and these are all the supplements I'm giving and here are the meds and this is how I feed and I cook this food this way and then I do this other thing. and. At the end, I said, you know, you're really doing everything. You, there's nothing for me to change about what you're doing. You're doing a beautiful job. But all that you really need to do is just to spend time with her. And for some reason, this person found that really revelatory in a beautiful way. It was like, oh, yeah, you know, I thought I had to figure out everything about all these meds and all these supplements and do everything right. And you're saying, that the most important thing I could do is just sit down here on her bed with her and be with her. Ah, what a relief that was to this person. And I think it's very true. I think we can get caught up in all the minutia and all the tracking and, and challenging stuff and can forget that what is really the most important thing for us to do is just to be there with them, which can be really hard. Like a lot of the time we're anticipating, you know, we're grieving right then and there, and then we're also thinking about how awful and painful it's gonna be when we actually lose them, and sometimes we're not really there with them because we're so stuck in that place of grieving our grief now and also grieving our grief that we're gonna have, and it can be really hard to sit with them, but if we can open our hearts a little bit to do that more, I think that's really the most useful thing. So, in trying to figure out when is a good time, the quality of life tracking that we talked about is useful. Um, some people find it really helpful to plan ahead because they have a time, I've had people set a euthanasia date with me two or three weeks in advance and then they feel like that's really great because they have this time to go do the favorite things that they always liked to do um, and to have people come and you know say goodbye and that it can be like a person's end of life when we know a person is going, that they can have all these meaningful interactions. I am not a person that's really comfortable with that myself. I'm totally fine. If, I think it's great if clients can do that. I, I can't do that. Like once I have decided, I have decided and I can't wait anymore at that point. So I fully respect how hard it can be to plan ahead. But the more you can plan ahead, the more choice that you can have about how things go. You know, if you can get a house call that to come to your house that does take usually some level of planning ahead. So just bear that in mind. Um, so I often find that kids are involved in this 
a situation. And depending on their age, there can be um, a lot of involvement for them or not much. Um, usually, I think at around the age of about six or so is when they start to understand enough that they might actually be comfortable being present at uh, euthanasia. I always advocate for people to ask their kids about what they want. I think kids are very good judges of what they actually are prepared for. Um, it's really good to have conversations in advance. Uh, many of us have had the experience where a beloved pet was euthanized and we had no idea that that was going to happen and we came home from school and our pet was gone. And that was very hard for me when that happened. And I, I feel like looking back, I totally could have handled it. And there are now some good books. I have a book list on one of my slides that has some useful books. Um, this one is a little tricky. I always recommend people read the book before they read it to their kid. <laughs> but some people really like this book and other people don't. And what the book is about is that the boy feels more comfortable that his dog has passed away because he told her he loved her every day. But the two other kids in the family didn't do that. And some people feel like when they're reading this to their kids that this, this is not the kind of message that they want to send, that, oh, you should feel guilty or bad in any way about the end of life of your pet. So mm -hmm. on the other hand, this concept of being with your pet every day and telling them, being with them and telling them that you love them is, is really valuable. But only if we know about it in advance, right? <laughs> Other things that can be useful, um, you know, visiting favorite places beforehand or sometimes afterwards to schedule uh, to scatter some ashes there. Um, having a memorial service for your pet can be a really great thing to do. Uh, having a memory box. There's one of the kids' books that I have on my book list that talks about making a memory box for someone who's who's lost that we miss and love to remember things about them. Sometimes kids are afraid that they're going to forget somebody that they love, and this can help reassure them that they won't. Um, memorial jewelry. Evie has a, a little bone-shaped piece of jewelry with uh, the ashes of our dog in it, and that means a lot to her. And uh, some of that stuff, I mean, there's memorial jewelry in every style, and some of it's really beautiful. Uh, tennis ball Valhalla. This is a thing that I came up with once on the way home from an appointment where I thought, you know, the people had had done a lot of their grieving beforehand, and so the appointment was actually almost like a wake. You know, they were able to talk about how much they loved their dog and all the things that he loved, and you know, he really liked uh, chasing the squirrels. And at the end, they, one of them said, he just really liked bananas. And the other, they had a whole story about how he loved bananas and how he would beg for bananas every time anyone was eating them. And I thought, it's so beautiful and wonderful. Like, this is it. This is the meaning of his life. Just the little things that he loved and how he liked being at home with them. And I thought, well, Valhalla, right, is the place where all the Norse uh, warriors go, where they have drinking and fighting. And, you know, like, what happens in your pet's Valhalla? Is it full of tennis balls? Is it full of bananas? Like, I think it's a, a great way to just really write out and appreciate all the things that they are. Um, a photo book you could make. And I saw one time in a catalog this really great frame. It was just a picture frame. It had a picture of a dog in it, smiling. And on the top, it said, thank you for everything. And on the bottom, it said, I had a wonderful time. And when I looked at this, I thought, that's what we need. We need to remember that. Like sometimes at the end of their lives, we're so consumed with the stress and struggle and difficulty of the end of their lives. And then once they're gone, it's really so helpful to remember that that feather image. Like most of their life was this wonderful, great thing where they had a great time and you loved them and they ate bananas. And like they really did have a wonderful time. And I have wanted to incorporate that into my sympathy cards for a while, but I actually haven't been sure that everybody would feel about it the way that I do, so I have hesitated to do it. But if it does mean something, try it. Just give it a try. Take a picture of your pet and you know, put that little frame around it and just see. Maybe it's helpful. Uh, and the tenth good thing about Barney, which is a great kid's book by Judith Bjorst, and it's about a cat who dies, and the family talks about all the good things about Barney. Um, and I totally recommend that one. But remembering all the good things, just all the ways you can do that. So here's my book list. And then I've got a website list. It's just two websites that I think are useful. Um, 
the top books are for adults and the bottom books, like the last five of them are really aimed at kids. But I find that kids' books, books that are aimed at kids are super helpful for adults too because they really boil things down into these very simple ideas and they make us all cry when we read them. Um, I really liked Being Mortal. That's a by a human surgeon about human end of life, but it really made me think a lot and it's beautifully written. Um, and then The Last Walk is about uh, animals. And some of that stuff I didn't really like so much, but the parts where she talks about the actual, like what it is like day to day to take care of her aging dog and all the difficulties that he has, they're so true and it's so common. I think that's worth it, just reading that for that alone because you get the feeling like I am not alone. It's been, everybody goes through these things. <coughs> So those are my books, and I can send you this list. And these are the websites. Um, the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care is primarily for veterinarians, but they do have resources for lay people, and they have a hotline list. And Lap of Love has a ton of uh, resources for lay people, not for veterinarians only, for you know pet owners, guardians. Um, and they've got that gray muzzle app and the geriatric questionnaire, which I have copies of. Okay, I have talked a lot. <laughs> Do you guys have questions? You talked a lot about dementia. Yeah. How common is that? Super common. Um, is that because they're living longer than? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think dementia is more common in humans, too, and we don't necessarily know why that is. But there's, a, I think, Many, 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 many older animals have early stage dementia that may be not that noticeable or not that problematic. But I would say probably a quarter of the animals that I see for end of life consultations are having some significant dementia issues. What are some of the early signs? So, since I, I think we attribute uh, hearing loss and vision loss to hearing loss and vision loss, but sometimes it's actually about not knowing what the meaning of the things you're hearing or the things you're seeing are. Um, being a little bit more withdrawn or just not acting like their normal self, not interacting like their normal self. I don't know, I, I would bet you that there's early signs that we totally miss that I don't even know what to tell you they are because the things that happen with people are so subtle in the beginning and we wouldn't know if a dog is forgetting those things or if he's telling us the same story four times in a row. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Where did I leave that bone? You talked a little bit about the money issue in terms of um, how you know, we have a lot of animals. And then we always get to this point where if you're in that gray area and you go to the vet and they go, well, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, and that would be 750 and this would be 650 and that would be, and I love my pets. And can you talk maybe about what, I don't even know, like what kind of questions are appropriate to ask? Like, like what will, like I ask, like what will, what will this give my animal mm -hmm. basically? Like are there other questions? Because it seems like that's what we all get hit with in the face, right? right. There's, there's not a lot of health insurance unless you were smart and you bought it when they were kittens. Yep. Um, and so now you're just faced with a lot of money mm -hmm. and a pet that is probably not going to get better but could conceivably with a lot of medical. What do you ask? Yeah, I think How that's a really change? good question. And I think that no one should feel uncomfortable about asking that question because, it, like you said, uh, insurance is thin on the ground and this, it really matters. So you should feel totally comfortable asking that question. And you should, uh, I would ask about, well, what are we gonna learn from this test? And how is that gonna affect decisions that I might make? Um, you know, it's sometimes we're gonna get more information, but you might not actually do things that differently. Um, so if the purpose of the test is to get a definitive diagnosis about exactly what type of cancer we think is going on, but you won't find that too useful because you're not planning on pursuing chemotherapy or radiation or surgery, you just want to treat palliatively, and maybe you just want to treat palliatively based on symptoms, um, that's a worthy question to ask. So 
how, what are we going to learn from this? How is that going to affect our decision making? Like, what is the benefit of that information to us? Do I need that information to help keep him comfortable? And if so, how? Um, you know, and in the case of a procedure, how likely is it that this is going to have a definitive good effect versus is it going to extend his life? And on average, maybe how long? Um, you know, what are the potential negative effects of this thing? Like if you're going to go for some biopsy, you know, is there a possibility that he's going to, what's, what's going to happen with anesthesia? What's the recovery time? Does that help? Okay. Does anyone else have more questions related to that one thing? Because I don't know that I answered that. You? Yeah, I have a question. And then the other way around, I think it is really important for anybody who has an animal which needs care to ask always, which I once didn't do, and therefore lost my dog, and it was really painful, um, is this medication possibly damaging the animal? Because when we have rescue animals, we don't know what happened in their former lives. And if an animal ever had a little problem, or if a horse went through a starvation period, and it is nicely recuperated, they are so much more sensitive to medications. And this nice visiting back from Marshfield said he did not ask us. So our dog got killed by the medication that was supposed to help the dog, uh -huh. because he had a liver sensitivity and the liver shut down. Yeah. And it was so painful, it took weeks until he finally was dead on IV in the middle of all the home, and it was really expensive, and the vet was not in any which way um, feeling guilty about it or bad or anything, because she just justified it by saying, well, I thought we wouldn't want to have a test. We never had before, had no choice. Right. Because we didn't think about asking, do, does this test, does this medication possibly kill the dog? That is it a test necessary? You know, and, yeah. And so, so you're talking about a, a really a rare of side effect, is, but something that's really yeah. significant and serious. As the owner of the animal yeah. always asks, is this medication having any possibly damaging side effects? Can it be tested before now? Yeah, because I think I'm that's it. A good question to ask is, in any situation, what's the potential negative effects here? And how likely are they to happen? Because you need to be informed in order to make those choices. And you should, that should be your choice about whether you're going to have testing beforehand um, or whether you're going to use a certain medication. This is changing the subject a little. OK. Um, but, and I'm not exactly sure how to word it, but uh, at a, a geriatric animal, you know, quite old, relatively healthy. Like, do you see dogs that just drift off in the night very often? 50% of the time? Is there? I mean, obviously, what can you give us? Can we kind of yeah, I, yeah, you know, there's that? a kind of a thing about uh, in veterinary medicine that I feel like there's a little bit of a presumption that everybody's life should end in euthanasia and that if it doesn't that someone has suffered too much and I don't agree with that. Um, I have seen animals go very peacefully. Um, rarely does it happen overnight suddenly but I've seen them go into a decline, a very significant decline over a period of just a couple of days where it's very clear that you know they've stopped eating and they've stopped drinking and they're just lying in their bed and they're not really interacting but they look peaceful um, it's hard to predict how the end of that will go, and sometimes there is some agitation toward the end or some vocalization or some breathing patterns that could be uncomfortable if you weren't prepared for them, although they don't necessarily mean that someone is genuinely distressed. It can be just something that the body is doing without conscious awareness. And I do think it's entirely possible to, to die peacefully without my help. Um, but that having been said, I feel like that 
I don't, I don't have a percentage for you because a lot of them I'm not hearing about. Right. <laughs> you know, sometimes I go to someone's house and they say, oh, my cat passed away and he just went very peacefully. No veterinarian has ever heard that. So <laughs> it's not hard to see why we kind of have perpetuated for us this idea that we need to be there to help. Um, but often people do call me about that. They're wondering maybe, how is this going to go? Is my pet going to go peacefully? Do I need you to come out here and, and help him go? Or can he go on his own? And so then we have a conversation about what you're seeing so far. Do you think he's comfortable? And how much that person can handle the sort of uncertainty of what might happen if it does start to look a little funky? And are they prepared to like zip off to the emergency clinic if they feel like that's what they need to do? Because it is hard to reach one of us to come to the house at the last minute. Um, so I don't know a percentage. Um, mm -hmm. It's entirely possible. And I think that uh, I've certainly been called to euthanize animals that I think probably would have gone peacefully on their own. Mm -hmm. But that's a pretty small number also. But, but you're saying also you could, like, let's just let this go peacefully and then at the last, like, something could be happening right at the end that would make it that you'd have to go off to the emergency? Yeah, because, you know, it depends how comfortable people are with not knowing exactly what's happening. And, you know, can we watch somebody whose breathing changes, you know, or, or the breathing sounds very hoarse or they're breathing very rapidly, or are they actually vocalizing? You know, can we feel okay with that and not knowing whether that means that they're in distress or not? They may well not be, but it's just hard to know. And so a lot of people's decision making at that point is based on, I don't know what's going on, but I don't want to worry that it's something that's uncomfortable, so I'm going to step in here. Um, it's, it's possible to have a sort of crisis kit for that situation um, and to give some sedation at that point that could be helpful because that's certainly what they do with people if they're having that issue as they're approaching death. Um, but it's tricky because then either it's got to be oral meds that you have to somehow get into them or injectable meds that you have to be comfortable giving. Um, or sometimes we can give it like rectally kind of as a suppository or as just an injection without a needle kind of just squirting something up the rectum. But that all of that stuff can be stuff that people just don't want any part of. Um, but if people are comfortable with that, they can do that. It's, I can't give a whole lot of that for someone to have on hand for obvious reasons because most of those things are controlled drugs that we have to regulate pretty closely. Did that answer that? Absolutely. OK, cool. Yes? Do you have any thoughts about the expression of the owner's emotional state during the dead dying process? Sometimes I wonder if too much expression adds to their anxiety. Right, yeah. People often worry about that. You know, they'll tell me, like, I'm really trying hard not to cry in front of him because I want this to be as peaceful for him as possible. And I know that animals are really sensitive, emotional feelers, you know, that I had a situation my own self, and many people have these stories where, you know, I, I had just adopted these two cats, they didn't want anything to do with each other, and I'm on my bed crying, and they both came up to me and touched their noses to my face like this, like right here, and then when I was over my upset, they went back to not speaking to each other for the next two weeks. So, you know, they, they can tell that when we're feeling things, we could probably tell a lot more if we weren't so you know, thinky with our big brains. But I don't think that they fear death the way that we do. Um, and I don't think that they necessarily even, uh, emotions are straightforward for them, I feel. Like our emotions are always overlaid with other emotions about our emotions. And that gets so complicated for us. And I wonder if just the simply our being sad is not stressful to them necessarily, but our being anxious about seeing, being sad and trying really hard not to be sad might be more stressful than our sadness. And I also feel like we can't not be sad. Like, you know, this is a really sad time. So to try to put pressure on ourselves to not be sad is really hard. And, and if we can instead 
open our hearts and feel that sadness and be there with it and be with them and recognize that our sadness is coming out of our love for them. Maybe that can be an expression of love and, and not distressing to them. But they do take on care of our feelings. I feel like that's actually the job, especially of dogs. You know, cats do it too, but dogs have been domesticated by people for a long time and we made them the way that they are because we wanted them to do jobs for us. And now we've taken away most of their jobs, but they're still there to help us. That's their reason for being, a lot of dogs. And they will take on our emotional well-being as their task, um, because that's the job that they have now. There's actually a, a book by John Katz about, I think it's called The New Work of Dogs, that mm -hmm. talks about that. I haven't read it, but I really, I yeah, I feel like that's totally true. So there is, there's just an inherent nature of dogs to do that, and there's nothing we can do about that. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little bit about, this is something that I was told when I was dealing with uh, in two subsequent years, because the dogs were just a year apart, um, that animals in general, um, and particularly cats, have a drive to survive, essentially. I mean, that's sort of in them evolutionarily to not show they're weak or that they're in pain or that they're distressed. Um, and that that can make it hard to tell what's going on because they're going to um, cover it up or, or, or not show it, not show the, that sign. Have you discovered in your work things that you find to be true as indicators of, of distress and, and stuff? that? go beyond, because I know when you said the bright line thing, it made me think of, I had this idea with my dog, because she loved to eat, that if she didn't show interest in food, that would be a clear indicator. Well, she never stopped liking food. The last thing we did together was share chicken. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was, never, that was never an indicator. But what I did learn was that she was incredibly restless, mm -hmm. couldn't settle, didn't stay down long, that that was an indication of pain that she just couldn't get comfortable. Um, she didn't cry, she didn't whine, she didn't do any of those things, but she just, you know, circled and paced and, and so on and so forth. And I just wondered if there were other signs that you've come to understand to be indicators. Um, like of pain specifically? Well, pain and or distress of, of some other sort. Yeah, I mean, I would say looking not relaxed panting, pacing, circling, being touchy and irritable, being withdrawn, hiding, wandering off, like, you know, disappearing, mm -hmm. um, not eating, did I say not interacting normally with the family? Mm -hmm. uh, it can be subtle, though. I think it's less so with predators, like dogs and cats, than it is with prey animals. Prey animals seem extra good at hiding what's going on with them. Um, but the signs can be kind of subtle, you know, like a, a cat in distress with breathing difficulty often doesn't look as bad to the people as it looks to me because of my trained eye. Yeah. Um, and some of that is just that mm -hmm. it just doesn't look as, you know, it's, it's a cat that's not moving a lot and it's actually visibly breathing, like a visibly breathing beyond, I mean, we can see our cats breathe all the time, but, you know, if they're putting just a hair more effort into that than they normally are. That can be such a subtle thing. But when they come in and I see that, I'm like, you know, this cat is breathing with great distress. So some of it, I think, is just something that you pick up over time or with exposure. I've seen so many cats with respiratory distress that I, I can see it. And someone who hasn't seen many cats like that won't necessarily pick it up. That, that's my lead in. I have a cat with respiratory distress. Um, he's, he's a 14 year old Persian. He's got that push in now. Mm -hmm. And so that's his downfall. And I've just had him for about a year, year and a half. And I think he kind of felt like he could come to me and fall apart because it's kind of what he's done. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm trying to learn to read him. Does your acupuncture help that? Maybe. Or how you, if, if the brachy, how do you say that? The brachycephalic. Cephalic? Yeah. The, the, the short note? Short, right. 
short-headed? Yeah. Does it help with that? Maybe. Um, it's hard to say. You know, some of it is an anatomically based, and there's nothing we can do about that. And then some of it might be inflammation based, so acupuncture could help with that. Um, some of it might be allergy related, that could be helped. You know, sometimes they've had upper respiratory infections as a young cat that caused scarring in, in their deep, kind of fine nose bones that are way back there. So it's not just a compromise of shortened airway, but also of damage that occurred in kittenhood. Um, so I don't know if it would help or not. It's worth a try, but I can't tell you for sure. Yeah. Oh, the glucosamine chondroitin. Do you think it makes any difference if it's, if, can you give a dog human glucosamine? Yeah, you can. A, a lot of those supplements are not uh, tested or they're, they're, they're because they're nutritional supplements, they're required to be safe as a foodstuff, but not necessarily required to have the activity that they claim. So I have concerns about a lot of supplements because there was a test uh, not that long ago in the journal of the AVMA that tested, uh, I don't know, 15 different supplements and found that one of them actually had what it said it had. So I tend to recommend the same two brands all the time because I know I feel like I can trust them. I'm sure there's other trustworthy brands out there. And, you know, at one point they did some testing on, uh, I think it was the Walmart brand, and it was actually good. But, you know, it's a generic and they get it from different suppliers and so it may have changed. I feel like I can rely on stuff from Nutramax, which they make Dasiquin, which is one of the, and the, a whole host of other supplements in that family. And then also um, Vetri Science, which is a Vermont company that actually makes their products in Vermont. And they're Glycoflex, and uh, they have Vetri Flex, which is supposedly only available from veterinarians. But I think their products are good too. So those are the ones I tend if to it, recommend. If it says it's standardized, do you trust it then or not? Mm. Um, I know that it says house calls. Does that have you ever met anyone like on the trail or something like at a trailhead or something? Um, so like a euthanasia setup? No, I haven't, but I would. <laughs> yeah. You have a question? I have a question. This is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> what is your question? One thing I didn't hear you talk about, I was trying to think that we might be interested in is what is it like, like when you go to someone's house? Like how long are you there? What um, <laughs> what is the procedure sort of that happens? Um, yeah. Like just for euthanasia? Yeah. yeah. Or you did, when, like when they made the decision to call you out, what is that process like? Right. Well, I will actually talk about a consult because that's useful to know too. Sometimes people really just don't know where they are and they know they have to think about end of life stuff but they don't know how to think about it or they got stuck because their pet is somewhere where no pet of theirs has previously gone and they don't know how to deal with that or maybe this pet is like their heart dog and they just can't, yeah. Um, or maybe they've never had a pet before and they don't know where to go with it. So having a consult, I would come out and it usually takes about an hour to an hour and a half and I do a physical exam and the person tells me all about the medical history and all about what's going on and all the challenges they're dealing with and then we talk about the various options that could address those challenges and we also talk a lot about sort of end of life philosophy and where they are and how much intervention they're interested in and how they view end of life and other end of life experiences that they've had with others that they've loved, people, humans, um, just so I can get a better sense of them. And mostly it's about me trying to help them figure out how they feel. Uh, and then sometimes at the end of that, the person is actually ready. Other times they're not. Sometimes they want a prescription for a medication that we've talked about that they've decided they want to try. So we do that. Sometimes they call me back a few weeks later and I come out and do the euthanasia then. Other times two years go by and the, Every now and again, I text him and I go, how's he doing? And they go, he's doing pretty good. And I go, all right. Uh, if I'm prescribing something in order to keep prescribing, I have to see someone at least annually. Um, but I, I sometimes turn into people's regular vet for a couple of years. Although if they want something like tests or procedures or interventions, I will refer them back to a clinic. 
Um, but for the euthanasia visit, what happens is um, we can be anywhere that's comfortable. So that can be outside or in whatever room. Uh, it take a little time to get to know the people and to, to say hello to the animal. And often people, even if they're pretty sure, uh, still have questions or they still want to confirm with me that I think what they're doing makes sense. So they might want me to do a physical exam or just explain what's been going on. And so we talk about that some if people want that. But if I don't require anybody to justify their decision to me, I've never seen anyone make this decision lightly um, or uh, in such a way that I feel like I should question them. Very, very occasionally I get to somebody's house and their main problem is pain and they haven't tried any pain meds. And I will ask them some questions to see if they might possibly be interested in pain meds. I don't, I really try not to act like they should be interested in them because I completely respect that somebody may not be interested and they may feel like that's just postponing something inevitable or they're not sure what the side effects would be or they just don't want to go there. So I really try not to make people feel like they should do that, but I also want them to know that there is this option and that it might be useful. And I try to give them a good idea of what the potential side effects might be. But most of the time, that's not the conversation because much of the time people have done, you know, in the case where they call me, knowing that they want euthanasia, they also know most of the time that they've already gone through the things that they can go through and tried the things they can try. Um, or sometimes they ask me that question. So we will have whatever level of conversation people want to have. That might be none, or that might be 45 minutes. It's just whatever works. Um, and then the actual procedure is for me to give sedation. Um, mostly I do that by injection, and mostly with cats, it's an injection under the skin of a small amount of stuff that's about half the size of a vaccination. Um, Often with dogs, it's either that, or if it's a big dog, it might be a two-step process if they're especially sensitive to pain, because the injection that goes in the muscle and some of the stuff that can go in that can be stingy in and of itself. So if somebody seems like they're gonna be super sensitive to that, I might suggest that we break it up into two steps. But sometimes people really prefer not for it to take that long, because the subcutaneous injection maybe takes about 15 minutes to take effect, and then if they're not fully asleep and we want to give another injection in the muscle at that point, that might take another 10 minutes. Sometimes people are fine with that and actually prefer if things take longer because it helps them sort of get used to what's going on. Other times, it's about as much as people can do to be there for this process, and it just needs to go as quickly and smoothly as possible, and I just try to read people or ask them if I need to ask them you know, how they feel about that. But um, the sedation part usually takes about 10 to 15 minutes. And then once they're fully sedate, I give the euthanasia injection. For cats, I just tend to give that into the abdomen. They don't feel anything at that point. And that takes maybe, depending on where it ends up and how much blood supply the place has, might be as quick as just a couple of minutes to absorb, but more commonly is usually about 10 to 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes to absorb fully, which is a very peaceful process, especially because they've had the sedation beforehand. They just gradually start to breathe a little bit less often sometimes, and then very slowly the breathing, the brain stops first, and then the breathing, and then the heart. If it's a dog, uh, if it's a very small dog, I'll do that injection in the abdomen like with cats. If it's a larger dog, I'll give the injection in the vein. And so I have a tourniquet and a little clipper to clip over the vein, and uh, the injection goes usually very smoothly. But again, I really like to make sure that they don't feel anything before this in case their blood pressure is not great. So sometimes I need to use a second vein. Um, I want them to, to not know about any of that. And I want us to know that they don't know about any of that, because I think that helps us mm -hmm. have our minds at ease, too. Um, and so in all cases, the brain stops first, and then the breathing, and then the heart. And so I just listen to the heart and let people know that it stopped. And then most of the time, people want to have some time with their pets uh, privately. So I usually go out to the car and put things away or sometimes you know if I'm going to be taking the pet for cremation I'll make a little space for them in the car so that we can carry them out 
and then I just tell the people I'm going to carry these things out to the car and I'll just wait there for you, you know, and, and you can come in to the door and wave and I'll come back in when you're ready. And once uh, someone asked me to go away for longer, they said, could you give us an hour? And I said, sure, I could go away and come back. I had to charge them a little bit more, but they were very happy with that extra time and it was fine to do that. So mostly we've been at people's houses, um, I would say all the time. I've had some clients that were just my clients for regular uh, like general medicine house calls that really didn't actually want to euthanize their pet at home. Um, they just didn't want to be thinking about that when they were at home. I mean, I've known clients who had to change veterinarians not because they didn't like anything that the veterinarian had done, but just because they could not face going back to the clinic where their pet had died. So, you know, everybody is different about those things. Um, and some people feel like they can't be present, and I understand that too. I've not had anybody uh, not want to be present at a house call, but I would totally respect that if they did. And in the clinic, I've had some times where people just said, I just have to say goodbye to him and go. And I understand that. It's really hard. So, oh gosh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to end on, because I feel like that's a really heavy note to end on. Um, yeah, and I, can I? A more up sort of question. Yeah, sure. Um, do you have any experience or have you heard anything about the use of CBD mm -hmm. with animals? I think I am legally anxiety. not allowed to <laughs> advise people about that, but I think I am legally allowed to tell you that I have known people that have used it for uh, agitation and anxiety for it's been used for seizures mm -hmm. with varying degrees of usefulness there's some a lot of trials in people mm -hmm. for seizures there's currently trials going on in veterinary medicine at uh, Colorado the vet school there for both I think I mean definitely for pain and I think also for epilepsy mm -hmm. so I've seen people using it and thinking it's helpful for pain agitation, anxiety, appetite issues, it seems more variable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's about all I'm OK to say. <laughs> but uh, it does seem like it can be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Just a quick comment. I don't know if people are aware, but the new hospital in Montpelier, that where the Berlin that was, the Montpelier, they do uh, acute care off hours, mm -hmm. so you don't have to go to Burlington if Yeah, you may still need to go. They don't have a full service emergency clinic hospital oh. full on after hours, but they have vets and they do seem willing to, you know, see you in the middle of the night, but they may still refer you on if that you have something like, for example, I had some clients that went there with a dog that had bloat and they said, we can't do this surgery here. You could go up to Burlington, but we actually think that he might well not make it. And then the people ended up deciding to euthanize him there. And they were very grateful that they had been able to have that here instead of having to go up. So you, it's not a full service hospital, but I do think they actually will see you in the middle of the night. And people have been happy with their service. And if it's something, you know, like porcupine quills or something, maybe they'll. So it's Where is this? It's a, the old, formerly Berlin vet clinic, now Montpelier Veterinary Hospital. Yes. Oh no, it's different people. Steve Carey used to run the Montpelier, uh, the uh, Berlin, and it's been bought by a couple that's uh, fiancés. The husband to be is uh, a veterinarian. He's from Morrisville. His grandfather and great-grandfather were vets. They met in vet school in Indiana. She's from Indiana. She practiced in Texas until recently. But so there, it's like a husband-wife or almost husband-wife. They're not quite married yet. Yeah. yeah.